Thank you, Jack. Um, thank you again for this kind invitation and uh, putting the program together. Thank you, Sripati and uh, friends. So I'm sure you know most of you all are doing the robotic surgery. You have set up the program, and you have went through these challenges of training. So why are we doing this? And as Dr. Elder mentioned, there's a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is we're not going to hang around with open surgery and the Hunterian era. And we're going to move on with the new technology, but it has to be very safe application and at the same time equal outcomes. And you see the multiple publications, including the publication related to the common audiences in economies, as well there's a mention of the robotic surgery and the rise of robots. So what are the challenges? The first challenges from my learning, I feel that there's a big interface between the surgeon and between the patient. And this big interface of the information system is difficult to understand. And you know, we lost that uh, immediate touch with the patient. You know, we lost the immediate touch with talking to our assistant surgeon. And it was very difficult philosophically. And this has to be overcome, that you know, you are working remotely, you have lost that uh, intimate, immediate relationship with the patient at the bedside. The second challenge was the generic system. You know, we are actually the, like um, hand out and drop me down in the family. We are, do not have a dedicated technology and information system for pediatric application as we have our microsurgery instrument for pediatric applications. The other inherent problem is loss of tactile sensation. And I'm sure as you go through it, you know, you start breaking the sutures, you handle the tissues, and you see the after effects. And that's another important challenge in the training. And for us, especially when you start operating on younger children, there's a constraint with the abdominal space. Now, for example, if you see here, these all three underwent pyeloplasty, and the youngest one being about five weeks. And you can imagine the challenges, how we can accommodate this generic system for these applications. The other thing is, we are pediatric urologists. We tend to deal with still hyperspadies, undescended testes, open reconstruction. And if you are a pediatric surgeon, you are doing still some pediatric surgery. And for the residents and the fellows, we do not have that much volume because every center is doing all the cases coming to their door. We do not have the center where it's dedicated for this specialty. So the case volumes are scattered. The case volumes are scattered. Everybody does not have that number of index cases. So this limits to the challenges of the training and how we can train our next generation surgeon. If you do the resident survey, both the Canadian and American, they do say that we do need more hands-on and we do need more training, especially in minimal invasive surgery. Ala Gonimi from uh, European Society of Pediatric Urology, when he did a survey, he found that each center doesn't do more than 10 laparoscopic pyeloplasty. So how can you get trained in a big department of two or three people associated uh, with the resident and fellows? I'm sure you know in India being we have such a high case volume, this may not be issue, but slowly it will trickle down. The recent pediatric urology fellowship training survey when performed from John Hopkins by Susan Gehert, Dr. Gehert's wife, and the mention of each fellow was we need more training in minimal invasive surgery and complex reconstruction. But you know, we are surgeons. Uh, we always want to overcome the obstacles. We want to do the best and offer the best to our pediatric patient. And the technology is always neutral. It's sitting there in the room, and it all depends on how you're going to operate. So how can we overcome these challenges of the training? And the first step in the training this one is basically listening to the didactics, like you know, these courses, understanding the instrumentation, understanding the system, and developing a structured curriculum program for yourself in an institution or in an organization. And if you spend enough time in the dry laboratory knowing this system and spending much of the time, I think the step one of the training uh, will lead to the step two of the training. And I'm sure you know, this is not something novice you all went through and you know, peg transfer. 
you know, doing hand-eye coordination and testing yourself where you stand. USC has published a paper looking at three different modalities of training. That is a dry lab, the wet lab, and then the proctor uh, mentorship training and seeing the outcomes. And what they saw is uh, among the three models, the, each are complementary to each other. So not one is adequate, just not dry lab, just not wet lab, just not supervised training. If you complement all these three together, then the efficiency and the outcomes are better for a training surgeon. And similarly, the same thing about the spatial cognitive ability. Now, every surgeon has a different skill set, and not 10 surgeons have the same thing. And this manuscript, when it looked at the, is there any correlation of the spatial cognitive ability and the outcomes to learn the robotic surgery? And they did not see that, but they say that, you know, only few can learn and do this surgical procedure application of this technology. So once you move on with your training, the step two in this training is the in vivo skills. And the weight lab is very crucial and essential part of this uh, technology training. And I must say that, you know, that's why, that's how I did it. And I highly recommend that doing a weight lab training before you practically embarking onto the live patients. And when you are doing this weight lab training, it just not has to be the training, you know, recording yourself, you know, assessing your skills, having a proctor and, you know, tell you what you did right, what you did not do right, and evaluating yourself so that you can improve. The step three in the training, you know, is basically the patient positioning and the port placement. And working as a bedside surgeon gives you a worth of a value uh, of this training. And the bedside surgeon do not feel bad if you are two surgeons working together and you know, oh, I have to stand at the bedside surgery all the time. Maybe it's worth if you can interchange the spaces that you know, you do half a console next case, I will do half a bedside surgeon next case. And the team and working together in a stepwise fashion is the best for your proficient training. So what are the sources available for all this training available? I'm sure you know there are a lot of online material. The Fundamental of Robotic Surgery Training has put on the stepwise training. AUA is designing the curriculum, and they also have uh, online sources for training. And we have the training like this, where we are holding the conferences, and then also hands-on training and some other live courses conducted at our place and across the world. Now, this is our training model at the University of Chicago for the resident and fellows. And what we do is we do a stepwise training. So the step one, as we talked about, is especially applicable to the first year residents. And then we move on to the second year residents for doing a part of console, a part of bedside surgeon, putting the ports in. And then in the third year, he's able to do some of the complex procedures, like you know, especially appendicovasicostomy anastomosis, or you know, complex phyloplasty anastomosis. And then he may be able to take the first year resident with him and allow him to supervise the first year resident so that he knows what he can learn and what, how to train the junior. Uh, resilience. Again, you know, this is nothing hard and fast, you know, there is no objective criteria here, but this is a stepwise assessment and training which we have worked out and it is working well. The next dilemma remains is how can we credential ourselves and how the professional organization can help us with credentialing. Uh, currently, again, you know, AUA has put out information on online, but there is not hardcore curriculum about credentialing, how we did credentialing for ourselves to become a graduate or a postgraduate, but I think this will be incorporated into the whole system of training, and eventually you may not need it. But at this stage, what we follow at University of Chicago is somebody coming at from a new uh, for a new position as a faculty, we want to see that how he is doing, and he will be proctored for at least initial five cases. Then he's going to do some additional cases and make sure that you know he's performing well and he's not a risk to the patient. And in turn, you will avoid the litigation complication. So this is we using at University of Chicago, and this is our subjective model of training and the credentialing, and it has been very useful in reducing the number of complications. Now, the third component of the training here is how you can be efficient. Because once you have 
done your learning phase, you need to move on and see that you know where your outcomes are. Are your outcomes comparable to the open surgery or to the laparoscopic surgery? What are your complications? What are your times? And I think we have to evaluate critically ourselves. And there is a learning curve for every surgeon, and it's different. But we have to keep assessing ourselves and critically evaluate ourselves. These are a couple of steps, as I talked about that, you know, what is the proper suggested mode of training the residents and fellows and surgeons or a new surgeon. I, this is on my experience, and as I said about, is, you know, attending the courses, uh, doing some dry skill labs, going to the wet lab, start doing simple reconstructions, and then complex reconstruction with the proctorship and supervision. Now, once you do these cases and you start doing, you do not see every week, or you may not be seeing in two weeks, because the practice patterns are different in different parts of the world and different parts of the country. So how can you keep up with your skills? And uh, Tom Lindu has published a manuscript saying that if you cannot keep up with skills for more than four weeks, your operating time will go up and your complication will rise. So how can you do it? And if you see all these professionals, including Mozart, and you know, everybody practices, including myself, you know, I do bicycling, everybody practices. So how can we practice this? And I think, you know, when you buy the robot, you have uh, some, uh, the box to go on and you can do some dry practice or you can go to the lab or you do some or other way exercises to keep it up. And some surgeons are inherently extraordinary, they may not need it, but I think we have to keep ourselves practicing and you know, warming up so that we do not downgrade. Or if you have four surgeons, not four can, everybody should do it. Maybe just two surgeons let them do it, and then two other surgeons can do other approaches and other surgeries. And I really like this um, manuscript published by Andres Eriksson in Psychology. And I highly recommend to read, it's a 90 paper, uh, 90 pages manuscript. And he did an original research about how your practice makes you proficient. And he followed the musicians for 20 years in Berlin. And he saw that if you practice eight hours a day, you are going to be the world's expert musician. And I'm sure, you know, we all surgeons, we do at least eight hours of surgery for 20 years, and we will be expert. Uh, but this manuscript is really applicable to any profession, how practice is important. Now, setting up the program, I'm just going to put four or five slides. You know, everybody has their program. But what are my thoughts? My thoughts are how we can, first of all, put the patient in the center and make sure that the outcomes are fine. And then you are, as a lead surgeon, who, are com who you are compassionate and you want to develop this technology and take the added risk and added anxiety. And we all do it in, again, all the sport professions. First of all, you are organization, your institution, your manager needs to convince that you need to bring this technology because as an organization you will be looking at a very advanced system to deliver the high care technology or cutting edge technology and they have to buy in the program. They may not make money initially because it's an investment and the investment they have to make it in yourself as well for your trading and little bit more operating room time and providing all the supports you need, and there may be initial loss of revenue, but eventually there will be a downstream revenue. And how you can convince that your business planning as a Wall Street doing is, apart from institutional willingness, that you can tell them that in five years there will be a downstream revenue. And how the downstream revenue will come in, there will be non-robotic surgery cases coming to your center. It could be a hypospadis. It could be a just you know simple other reconstruction case, and that's downstream revenue which will potentially you know cut back the cost and the investment. If you have a philanthropist, that's fantastic. Get the capital cost um, that will out offset a lot of investment initially, and you know that's a good model. But you know philanthropy is again difficult in different parts of the world. How can you reduce the upcoming cost as you are using the system? And usually I suggest you know four or five specialities should come together or three or four surgeons should come together and do a you know, good number of appropriate indicated cases and keep the instruments as low as possible. And when I talk to Sripati and Sujit, you know, I remember and I also talk to them and including Dr. Elder that keep two or three instruments using. You know, don't keep on changing the instrument, which is, but you know, if you have to use it, use it. Do not compromise the outcomes. 
it goes without saying that we have to build a team. Any profession you do, anything you want to achieve, you're not going to be the solo runner. You want to have your assistant surgeon, you want to have your nurse, you want to have your um, anesthetist, and you want to have your business manager in your team. And you're all going to build a team, and that will be the face of your program. So the business manager I just put in here, from my experience, I'm sure, you know, uh, what equity foundation has itself a business plan and you know how they work but what i think is the business manager should work on to support you initial you know to get on to the start you know doing either a road show letting the people know but uh, again you know this has to be a very informed message you do not want to let them know what is not possible and then you know make sure the supplies are adequate the instruments are adequate you have a dedicated block time you keep logging up the all the cases and keeping the information so this business manager is very crucial for your development of the program and as you start doing it you know take the cases which you are comfortable with case the cases which are you know you've been doing routinely just like a pyeloplasty as we talked about this morning and be in the operating room from you know, start to the end. And that's my philosophy, even though I'm a training, at a training institution, I will be in the room, even though my resident and fellow is doing it, I do not want to take the risk of you know, leaving the room and having some complications. Keep the frequency of the procedures going on. If you have two cases, uh, do not finish it off in a week. Maybe do one and this week, maybe another in next week. And every case you do, initial 10 patients, you do debriefing how everybody did it. If somebody did it good, you know, say you did very well. Do a positive criticism and you know, not a negative constructive criticism. It should have to be positive constructive criticism. And I will end the talk with saying the Aristotle's quote, you know, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is an act but not an habit. And thank you for giving the opportunity.